So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, Anim, bonjour. I'm Donna Ratzenkamp, and I have the distinct pleasure of leading the outstanding team here at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. We're still waiting for a few people to trickle in, but we're really committed to staying close to our timeline, so we have lots of time for a dialogue. Uh, so we're going to get started, and, and people will move in as, as they come along. At the Robert McLaughlin Gallery, we proudly begin all gatherings, acknowledging that we are situated on the ancestral and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and the traditional territory of the Mississauga Nation. And we are honored by Indigenous teachings and are thankful for the deepening relationships that we have. Thank you so much for coming and taking two days out of what I'm sure are very busy and hectic schedules. It's hard to take time away. Uh, but we're really excited about this opportunity for all of us to just pause and reflect and take some learning away. My role is brief. It's just to get everyone settled, to thank a few people, and there's a little bit of information to share, and then we're going to move into the exciting part of things. The impact of digital technologies in our realm cannot be underestimated. I would imagine everyone in this room has been thinking about it wrestling with it perhaps in some ways, or just trying to explore it. Um, we're excited to engage in this conversation with all of you. It's a much needed opportunity to step back, to reimagine, and to better understand how we might navigate the challenges and the opportunities of the digital era. It's very important that we thank our sponsors. Uh, Lindsay LeBlanc, curator at EQ Bank, is here. Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks so much. Uh, EQ sponsors the Emerging Digital Artist Award and 2018's winner, Anna Eiler, was just announced last Thursday evening. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, we also welcome and thank Surface Impression, a digital strategy and delivery experts for the cultural sector in North America and in Europe. Uh, Dr. Amy Hetherington and Peter Pavement are here. Great. Thank you so much. And of course, we offer tremendous gratitude to Canada Council of the Arts, specifically the Digital Strategy Fund. Without their investment, we would not be about to engage in this important dialogue. Uh, Sylvie Gilbert is expected to be here. She's probably just running a little bit late, so we'll be sure to thank you, thank her when she arrives. A few housekeeping items. Uh, there is free Wi-Fi. You're going to be looking for RMG. It should be a fairly easy, seamless transition for you. Gender-neutral washrooms are on the first floor and the fourth floor, letting you know that the first floor is actually the lower level. It's one thing that people often get confused about in here. Also, on that lower level, there's a refillable water station down there. So if you have water bottles, you can, you can fill them up there. Very early in this process, we talked about objectives. Uh, what, did, what did we want this, this two days to be? And one of them, one of many, was to ensure that there was space for the voice of participants. Uh, we want to understand what your most pressing thoughts and issues are, and we're committed to maintaining that space and the time for your questions. Lucas is going to be at the back. He will have some numbered cards. He will help guide the speaker is letting them know when they've got five minutes and two minutes, just being helpful in that way. And then uh, we can ensure that we have a question period that's fulsome and that doesn't get squeezed and goes from half an hour to five or ten minutes. So we're, we're going to work hard on that for you. It was really clear that a project of this magnitude required strong partners, and uh, the RMG locked arms with the Ontario Association of Art Galleries, re relied very heavily on the digital acuity and the network of OAG's executive director, Zainab Virgi. Uh, Zainab is a media artist, curator, writer, senior arts administrator, and public intellectual. As an accomplished leader in the arts and culture sector over four decades, she's helped to shape cultural policy at all levels of governments and significantly contributed to the building of cultural institutions and organizations in Canada and internationally. And it's been a pleasure to work with her, I might add. Uh, I look forward to learning from and with each of you over the next couple of days. And please welcome Zainab to the podium. She will offer the opening note and serve as your guide. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. Right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so thank you, Donna, for those kind words. Um, the RMG-OAG partnership um, has worked really well, and obviously we are here today 
uh, bringing together this amazing set of people, the audience, the panelists, the presenters, together to have this really important conversation. It's something that the art gallery sector um, hasn't engaged in very much, I think, over the years. Um, so I'm very glad to have this partnership with the RMG. Thank you, Donna, Linda, the entire team at RMG and at OAG for working extremely hard in putting this together. So, um, well, let's see. Oh, sorry. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Um, so, good morning to everyone, and I'm really going to just be very brief in my opening note. I want to offer a contour to the context that we have gathered here to discuss. So, as I began putting my thoughts together, this exhibition at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, UK, came to my mind. This is tomorrow. It opened on August the 9th in 1956 and was organized by the British architecture and critic of South African origin, Theo Crosby. And as Paolo Nicolan observes, it was a crucial event in the history of art, a seminal exhibition that represented the visual expression of a debate that had been going on in Great Britain since the Second World War about the role of the visual arts in post-industrial society. And I'm invoking this exhibition as a, matter, as a metaphor because it alludes to two points. One is that art galleries have historically faced challenges influenced by changes in society and they've successfully overcome them. And the second is that the optimism that it connotes, we're already in tomorrow. And as we proceed further, let's keep these two points to guide us in our endeavor to forge a path forward, one that we've been able to do it before, and two that we have to be optimistic about how we, we move forward in this current uh, era and context. So I'm going to spend uh, a f little bit of time on this slide um, because I want to sort of talk about these three things, the reconfigured space, the public site, and 1994. So bear with me. So the visual arts sector is rapidly changing, and we know uh, that it is, and we feel it. Um, and so is the larger cultural sector within which it is embedded. Most current debates are about balance. Where, for example, do the older pleasures of contemplation meet those of participation? You know, I was at the opening at MoMA, and they had a whole floor dedicated to new artists that was all about participation. The teeter-totter, seesaw, the, the dart throwing, the fill out the card about your agency, etc., etc. The floor people loved the most, participation. Have we forgotten to contemplate? I don't know. Um, and then, how is pop popularity achieved while rethinking the canon? How can public collections keep pace with private ones? You know, the big private Michael O'Dane museum, right, you, that, that's opened up, and there are many others. Or in the face of cuts to state and municipal funding, what is the proximity between public institutions and private interests? Public art galleries in Canada have a specific history, and those historical contexts and rationale need to be reevaluated to foster the imagination of the art gallery in Canada, to enable the reimagination and reconfiguration of public art galleries so that they are able to reinvent themselves. We have to and must delink from our histories. In the larger context of the emergence of the know-all society, in which the triumph of the algorithmic know-how, of course, of which we are all beneficiaries, but this means all aspects of our lives' activities has, has become part of a set of procedural and programmed actions. Not to deny the accomplishment, accomplishments, rather to say how our engagement of the minds and lives in the shaping of the world should proceed. Also, this algorithmic knowledge is often stereotyped as problem-solving. 
In fact, such algorithmic knowledge, it is claimed at a higher level that it is largely about generating problems. It is about innovation. But if one thinks carefully, innovation means shifting and changing things within a particular framework. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this reconfigured space. As Hal Foster suggested in his essay, After the White Cube, quote, one pressing dilemma is the sheer variety of exhibition spaces required by contemporary art, end quote. While the white cube isn't completely defunct, Foster concludes, it has become more various. Black boxes for projection <clears throat> and bray boxes, or what the MoMA plan calls art bays for dance and performance. What happens next after this current wave of building projects? Is this the end of an era of expansionism or the state start of a new phase? Might we be moving instead towards institutions that have multiple sites that are networked, collaborative, or even Im immaterial? Now, on the public site, we cannot avoid the closer collaboration about the commercial world and the traditional public sector. The question is, will there be a Gangosian MoMA or a Google Tate, for instance? Here I'm alluding to the very outposts like the franchise galleries Gargosian or the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, for example. There will be rising inequality of opportunity between museums and galleries, insurgent institutions, new and old, that crowdfund from a wide, shallow support group to undermine the universalizing mainstream and offer new forms of agencies to communities. There will be an emergence of the idea of the museum of the commons that breaks with ownership and commercial logic to serve new constituencies and generate a different political and intellectual space for art than the tired territories of modernity. 1994, the art economy is speeding up, and this is really about that, the rise of the mega galleries, franchises, about the rise of art fairs, um, I remember even in, as early as the late 80s and 90s as the, becoming the executive director at the Western Front in Vancouver. And the artists, the founding artists there would never have come or put their work in an art fair. It was not considered. It was not market oriented. But last year, all those people were at the Toronto Art Fair because they have no choice. They have nowhere to go. So there's a precise date for that, 1994, when this starts to happen. Before that, art fairs were trade fairs. And I remember how artists in the Métis made that so emphatic, as I just pointed out, right? And they thought it was in poor taste. That's how it was in the beginning, and has been quite astonishing to see how things have turned around in the 30 years. There's been really a total reversal. So what this implies <clears throat> is that the sacredness of gallery as the central institution of modernism has been dislodged with the postmodern, post-structuralist movement and from the center. Galleries have made into outposts of a new order wherein the art fairs play the pivotal role. Um, so Peter Weibel, um, um, from Zykeem, in his unique ways, also offered a simple but, you know, a rather simplistic understanding of that shift that we are, we are facing in a, in, a, in a course that I took from him, um, from Cezanne to the computer in the 90s, you can see Weeble points to this shift in this order, that the vertical order of the relationship between a work of art and tool has become horizontal. And this observation has a significant impact on our understanding of contemporary aesthetics and art history. So, art gallery and technology, I think future technologies will certainly offer entirely new experiences for visitors to galleries and museums, but these will only come to life if they draw inspiration from the collections and from the ideas that artists have and then connect to new audiences. The gallery museum of the future will bear witness to the degree of intelligence, love, sensitivity with which it has been developed. As most innovations in today's society, 
are technologically driven, we must imagine that museums too will prioritize new technologies. In a few years, 360 3D presentations based on algorithms of our personal preferences will conjure up a musée imaginaire. A built-in update or surprise factor will make sure that our experience is not purely what we expect. The vast majority of institutions will have embraced an instrumental experiential approach in, wa in which art from any time or place is understood as a tool with which to achieve some kind of impact or impression on the visitors. The biggest challenge facing museums will be that while there will be a much greater focus on the viewer's subjective experience, there will be a commensurate rise in the demand for quantitative or at least qualitative measurements. Museums will need to prove to funders that they are achieving their impact targets. On the bright side, the presentation of objects, especially unique ones, will remain a powerful dimension of music pro museum programs. However, the line between the art and things that are simply remarkable will have become considerably blurred. If we are lucky, the museum of the future will look little like the museum of today, but it will be just as compelling and transformative, if not utopian and optimistic. Now, but this history of the relationship between the art gallery and technologies is, is quite fascinating, and um, we must look at some of these phases. Um, I want to just talk about this uh, nostalgic museum in Amsterdam. Um, because research scholars such as Loic Talon and Nancy Proctor have offered some very interesting insights as they research the role of technology in these institutions. Way back in 1952, this museum developed the world's first ever museum audio tour. And it was William Sandberg, a lesser known museum professional, and yes, Philips, the company, that are responsible for this innovation. Almost all large and the majority of medium-sized museums offer audio tours. After Stelgic, it was first employed in Britain in 64 at the British Museum, and the audio tour's history runs parallel to that of the blockbuster exhibition, an exhibition format consciously constructed to appeal to a wide audience with a, with a range of arts experience. For many, their first visit involved an audio tour and this has made the audio tour something of a visitor expectation. I don't want to dwell much on here, but, but I want to um, put across the moot point that after this innovation, which ruled until 1979, Sony came out with the Walkman. And subsequently, post-95, the arrival of digital technologies allowed direct access, or commonly or popularly referred to as random access. And this new generation of audio guides overcame the unpopular constrictions of linear tours, one size fits all phenomena. So you can walk around with your own phone today and maybe do your own audio tour and have it shaped to your own personal preference. So I want to reiterate that uh, this innovation means shifting and changing things within a particular framework. So what is this that we're facing today? What is the broader question? What is digital culture? And I just want to spend a few minutes to talk a little bit about this. We're all embedded in it. We live it. I know you know what it is. But let me tell you a couple of things you may not be aware of, uh, or you may. Um, so this is the tra this trajectory of art, science, technology interactions. And this slide shows that trajectory just as a form of illustration. And you can see we move from these solid state electronics from 1960 and 80s, moving all the way down to the convergence phase of nano, bio, and ICT. Um, and you can see that these practices are established in the 60s in the Canada Council, uh, you know, new media art section, I think starts in 1982, uh, you know. So you can see that how these moves start to occur. And, and this trajectory gives you sort of a sense of how we've been engaging in these conversations and engaging with this technology for a while. <clears throat> um, I wanted to show you this map uh, because there's, um, 
um, this, is a, this map was done as a result of the collaboration of the Canada Council for the Arts with the Canadian Heritage Information Network to commission a project on mapping digital culture in Canada. And um, I was on the committee to work out these prototypes of this mapping activity, and we came out with this map, and you can see, unfortunately, that it is in a JPEG, but, and I can't highlight it, but it did look at the relationship with the international scene, it looked at, thank you, um, it looked at, um, you know, what was the presentation and exhibition network in Canada, what was the dissemin dissemination and distribution. We also were trying to f understand the gaps. Uh, we were looking at how do you strengthen the field of digital culture. Um, so you can see that, you know, a lot of work has been done in trying to understand um, where, where we, this was done in the, let me see, in the, in the 90s. So this is already like 20 years ago we, we were doing this, trying to see the space and understand, you know, what the state was uh, and, and have some uh, uh, understanding of what could be done. Um, so, I'm going to move on. Um, so there, there's some seven milestones here that, that came out, and, and you can see that it starts with Michael Century's Pathways to Innovation in 99. And, and when I was at the Canada Council, when we worked on that map, the Digital Art, Arts Network was formed. It was a, a, a group of, of officers that decided that we needed to address the whole digital because music was using it, media arts was using it, visual arts, everyone was starting to use digital in some way. And, and it was not just digital art, but it was art in, the digital, in a digital culture that we were trying to address. Uh, and then the Artist University Research Alliance with the Canada Council for the Arts was created. Uh, it was called Aura, similar to the Cura. Uh, and then this study of digital cultures across 11 countries started, uh, et cetera. You can see the work done at Banff and Euphoria Dystopia came out. And last year, the creation of the digital strategy at the Canada Council, which is again putting money in for us to, to understand and, and engage with and interact with and take it on. Uh, and, and hence, here we are today. Okay. So, I think that, um, sorry, I'm missing something here. One of the things that um, I, I think that we want to do today, and what this is about is, is this question, right? The question that we want to be grappling with. You know, uh, you can see art and to content. The artist has now become the creative entrepreneur. What is the art gallery going to become? What's the, that's the question we're here to, to grapple with today, and I think it's going to be very exciting. Um, so the one thing I do want to point out is that I think we also have to remember that technology is political. And as we engage in our questions to remember this, this power relationship, also that exists. Oops. So I'm just going to spend a minute here on the OAG, because um, I believe that the culture sector will see a substantial overhaul as it will soon be data-driven, especially within the public sector. And I'm aware, is the, aware that we'll see this even morphing into, let's say, for the blockchain and other ecosystems. It's just around the corner. What does that mean for the public gallery? What does it mean to artists' rights? What does it mean to access? There's so many questions, intellectual property, copyright. It's all about to shift in a huge way. The time is ripe for this broader dialogue, which is about, to, which is about how to strengthen the culture sector and by improving its relationship to data. We at OAG, the Ontario Association of Art Galleries, believe that through further conversation and coordinated leadership, the culture sector can embrace 
this new era, this data-informed decision-making, and all the opportunities that it can afford. This will have an impact on multiple fronts, ranging from advocacy, production, dissemination, administration, and above, and above all, the very sustainability of the idea of culture as a public good. We serve the public art gallery, and we are questioning what does that mean today? How can we continue? In what shape will we continue? How will we remain um, sustainable? So as a successive step to the data exchange program that we've been doing over many years, OAG is taking the leadership in this initiative and, we will, and this will benefit our membership as much as the larger culture sector and we will work with our membership in, in various ways in, in, like we have done with the RMG and the RMG has done with us uh, um, both ways. Uh, to, to move this forward. So the ambition of this symposium is really about asking those questions. We want to focus on, on asking the questions, the right questions. We have an inclusive process and we want to offer every opportunity to incorporate a range of thoughts and ideas. You are going to participate in this and we'll be looking for your input. Um, we want it, this to be ambitious and optimistic as we start exploring some of the larger questions uh, that the symposium will respond to. And for example, how can the art gallery sector embrace the digital ecosystem? What is the opportunity for value creation for collections in a digital age? How can we develop a new framework for the public's interaction with visual culture and for engaging with and influencing the international visual discourse. Canada can play a role here. So that's really what this is all about. Um, be, um, I think, you know, much like the exhibition, this is tomorrow that I spoke about at the beginning, at the opening. This symposium offers a structure made up of many cells orbiting like satellites around a central idea. You all will play an active part in this conversation, not only offering an approval of the event, but serving as a carrier for this symposium's um, pedagogical message. So uh, we're really excited. We thank you all for coming. Uh, again, thank you to the RMG team, the OAG team, all the volunteers, the presenters, and the audience. Now, it is my... Um, my real pleasure to introduce our next um, speaker. It is Mohamed Salemi, our first keynote speaker for this session. About a year ago, in an exchange on Facebook, I asked uh, Mohamed whether he would like to speak uh, at this perspective conference as we were thinking about it. Uh, and I'm glad that he agreed and that he is here uh, today and we have him with us. Uh, Mohammed um, rep represents an influential voice of his generation. He is a Berlin, Berlin and New York-based Canadian artist, critic, and curator who holds an MA in Critical Curatorial Studies from the University of British Columbia. He's a passionate writer and speaker. He's a prime provocateur whose empathy for disagreements offers a more pregnant space for discourse to happen. Today, he's going to present some of his new ideas, perspectives, and thoughts on the issues that we have gathered to have this conversation on. Can public institutions of art play a mediating role in harnessing the powers of technology for reinstating the role and power of art in shaping culture? This is the question that he poses and he will unpack in his response. Modeled on the form of cultural and political manifestos from the 20th century, he will review the record of the usefulness and relevance of electronic communication technologies in regards to the institutional life of, a public, of public art institutions, while at the same time pointing to the detrimental role these technologies have had on the power of art, artists and institutions to create, assert and disseminate new cultural realities, something we used to call meaning in our post-globalized and hyper-interconnected world. I think it's going to be very exciting. Please welcome Mohammed to the podium to deliver his key keynote and manifesto for algorithmic access to public art galleries and museums.